Hi, friends. This is John. Welcome back to the Regenerative Agriculture Podcast, where we have all kinds of fun conversations related to soil health and plant health. And in this in this fascinating world, as we are learning that plants have brains and they have the ability to think and to make informed decisions, uh, and they have uh, they make very conscious specific informed decisions about how to interact with their environment, how to respond to different stimulus, how to associate and support their microbiome or not. Um, It's, we, we develop this, we're developing a very different perspective than what we have generally collectively held uh, historically on the way that plants interact with their environment and the way that they interact with their microbiome. And of course, the way we move these boundaries forward is constantly by uh, researching, by studying more and trying to understand how interactions are happening. And some of these, some of these experiments can be very sophisticated, but often some of the best discoveries come from the simple experiments or simple observations out in the field. So for our conversation today, I'm joined by Maisie Canetop, who uh, ran an experiment that caught our team's attention here at AEA. They were delighted by uh, the simplicity of the experiment, the elegance of the experiment, and the results that came out of it. So Maisie, thank you for uh, being willing to join me today. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and the experiment, and what inspired you to, to run this experiment. For the past three years at my middle school, we have been required to do a Stanford project every year. And my dad is, he works um, in like an urban farm and works to promote um, farm and like the like agriculture he like works in that area so I have like grown up around like always hearing about that in my house and I knew I wanted to explore something similar to that um, and something like a huge problem that I think like impacts a lot of young people is climate change and the impact on the environment that humans are having So I wanted to connect those two areas. So I decided with the help of two soil scientists, Dr. Akila Martin and Dr. Israel, that I wanted to research how we could exchange the use of harmful agrochemicals that are depleting soils and exchange those for endophytes, a type of bacteria, which instead of depleting soils helps regenerate them and promotes ecosystem health as well as plant health. And so what did your experiment end up looking like? So the way I started, I took buckwheat seeds and I also took soil and I sterilized that soil because I was only testing one type of bacteria. So I needed to control the environment and I inoculated some seeds and I did not inoculate the other seeds. And I had four different groups. I had one group that was the control, which was the non-inoculated seeds grown in sterilized soil. I had one group that was inoculated seeds grown in sterilized soil. I had one group that was inoculated seeds grown in non-sterilized soil, so soil that was just collected from my garden. And then I had a non-sterilized, sorry, non-inoculated seeds grown in non-sterilized soil. I proceeded to grow those plants for different periods of time. So I had plants growing for two weeks, four weeks, and then three months. Um, And after that period of time, I would collect plant samples and clean them with like a mesh to get all the soil off the roots. And originally my plan was to use a software that called RhizoVision that analyzes plant root hairs, but Unfortunately, I didn't have access to like the proper like technology to use that software. So I ended up having to like re-engineer my plan. And I decided to use a microscope to take pictures of the roots and then count the root hairs myself instead of using the software to do it for me, which ended up taking a little more time than I originally planned. But it ended up it ended up okay. And I discovered after collecting samples from all my data um, from all four groups that the plants that were inoculated overall, um, despite being in non-sterilized soil versus sterilized soil, 
um, overall had the most number of root hairs. So root hairs are on like a root. They have little shoots that you can't see with your eyes. They're microscopic and they allow bacteria to cycle through the plant. So by measuring root hairs, it was a good way to see how the endophytes were actually impacting the plant. Um, and I also measured bricks, which is a way to measure the sugar level of a plant or of any liquid. And I found that, well, originally I thought that the plants that were inoculated would have higher bricks levels, but it turned out they didn't, which I realized was because they were using their sugars to flower, while the plants that weren't inoculated still were using their sugars to produce cotyledons and grow new leaves, which meant that the sugars were more concentrated, which in turn supported my original hypothesis that the inoculated plants and that the endophytic bacteria would benefit the plants. So this, this, is, this is an important point. Did you observe the plants to be at different developmental stages or to develop at different speeds based on whether they were inoculated? Or the inoculated plants, not only did they develop faster, but they also had a higher survival rate. So the plants that weren't inoculated, more of them died and didn't survive. The plants that were inoculated had healthier, fuller leaves and began to flower faster, while the plants that weren't inoculated hadn't started to flower yet by the time my experiment ended. So even over the course of a 90-day experiment, they were not yet at the flowering stage, which is quite slow for buckwheat. Yeah. I think that's also due to the fact that it was in sterile soil, so there was like very little microbial activity, which wasn't great for the buckwheat plants. How significant were the differences that you observed in the root hair development? And I'm also curious just about the overall root biomass. What did the root biomass uh, and the root hair development, how was it different? And I'm also curious about how it was different on the sterilized versus the non-sterilized soil. Yeah. So I didn't take the biomass of the roots. I only looked at root hair growth. And originally I wanted to measure like the length of root hairs, but I wasn't able to do that without like the software that I wanted to use. So I couldn't do that in my experiment. So the plants grown that were inoculated in sterile soil versus non -inoc like the non-inoculated ones in sterile soil, they had pretty, they had like a pretty similar numbers. The ones that were inoculated did have more overall, but they were real closely followed by the ones that weren't inoculated. The biggest difference, even though they had similar root hairs, the biggest difference was in the like the growth that I observed, like how quickly they developed. And what was how would you describe the differences? How much more rapidly did the plants develop that were inoculated? What were the if you can describe that? They were that they were very different. At the end of my experiment, um, I have I took photos of the control and the plants that were um, the seeds that were weren't inoculated and compared them to the ones that were. And the plants that weren't inoculated, they only had like th like five leaves, and they still had cotyledons, as I said, and they weren't flowering, and they were pretty short. Um, while the plants that were they were tall, like they were like spilling out of the containers, and they had many leaves, and the leaves were fully developed and they were flowering. And so that was on the sterilized soil. Was a similar pattern also true on the non-sterile soil? Yeah, they were less developed than the plants that were inoculated in the non-sterilized soil, but um, they, they were kind of like in the middle ground. So they had developed leaves and didn't have cotyledons anymore, but weren't as far along as the plants that were inoculated. So the, the central um, thesis or hypothesis that you were that your testing method is based on is you're you're extrapolating the presence or the activity of associated endophytes based on root hair development in yeah. essence. And uh, I'm sorry, I kind of distracted you because I asked about overall root biomass, but um, what did you discover in terms of the the root hair development itself did you have substantially more root hair how much more so at the first like point like the first time that i collected the root hairs the inoculated plants had like a huge amount more 
like it was very like apparent they had like triple the amount of root hairs and then as time passed like the other groups slowly started to catch up but the gap they were never able to close the gap so um during the second like time area like the second so you were collecting at that, two weeks and four weeks and then three months i think you said three months yeah yeah so at the second time they had like about like 300 for the that i counted like the of root hairs, the native microbes and inoculated and then the this native microbes and then the inoculated plants had 600 so it was almost triple and then during after three months the plants that were inoculated and um in sterilized soil versus the plants that were inoculated in native soil um had almost 300 more so over time the gap slowly started to close but the inoculated plants always had more root hairs. I think this is a common phenomenon that we observe in, in practical application out in the field is that um, when seeds are inoculated, there is often this, this early and rapid proliferation of biology. And if you have soils yeah. that have where the, the microbiome is compromised, uh, they, they do have the ability to recruit microbes from the soil microbiome, yeah. but it just, it takes time to build up that soil, that, root microbiome population and they never fully catch up to what um so your your experimental evidence matches very well with what we observe out in the field so the what was the how difficult was it to set up this experiment and to conduct it um i had so when i started my experiment i started it like months more than three months before like the deadline and i had to repeat the experiment three times because in the beginning um my soil was it had the ph wasn't like just it wasn't the right ph for the buckwheat and many of them died and i didn't have enough to collect the number of samples that i needed so then i started over and i repeated the same process again and the same thing happened where they didn't survive so then i did it a third time and I changed the pH by adding sulfur because buckwheat prefers more acidic soils. And this time I did have enough samples. I also think that it was difficult for the buckwheat to survive in completely sterilized soil, which um, contributed, I think, to the higher like death rate of the buckwheat plants. Um, so it was it was difficult to have to redo my whole experiment multiple times to get the results that i wanted and it was another challenge for me was taking all the pictures of all the root samples because i had i had a lot of groups i had a lot of root samples and i was taking i had to take like like 70 between like 50 and 70 photos of each sample and then count the number of root hairs for every single photo for every single root and that that took a lot of time so that that was challenging but i it, it worked out in the end so that sounds like a lot of counting anyway yeah yeah it was a lot of counting so you mentioned the the unexpected results in regards to the the variation in bricks response versus the plants that were flowering and those that were not um, were there any other results that surprised you or that were unexpected it surprised me that the plants that were grown in native microbes were like how you described earlier like they started with a lower number of root hairs and it surprised me how they were able to like, catch up over time but my hypothesis in the end was proven correct so although the bricks number surprised me um and the initial to final numbers of plants grown without the inoculant surprised me um the overall results um supported what i initially thought I think it's worth noting for um, for the benefit of our listeners, 
we're describing this experiment in terms of the the endophytic microbes and obviously you're you're measuring root hair development which i think based on uh, Dr. James White's work and other people's work, uh, those certainly are associated with uh, the presence of endophytes within the plant and their their activity. Um, and also, the product that you were using was not just endophytic microbes alone. It was also mycorrhizal fungi and other things. And this year, I'm building off of my project from last year, and I'm taking individual strains of endophytes specifically bacillus species like bacillus subtilis and thuringiensis and inoculating buckwheat to see what how the specific strains impact the root hairs and then i'm also growing buckwheat um on a farm to see how the inoculant will work in a actual agricultural environment instead of in a lab laboratory environment yeah, it would be interesting. It, of course, it would add another layer of complexity, but it would be interesting to, again, compare to see what if, if there is a contrast between the individual species and the combination of different species that also includes the mycorrhizae. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Maisie, thank you. Thank you for running the experiment. Oh, our, our team would not be happy if I didn't mention that the product that Maisie was using was actually BioCode Gold. So, Maisie, thank you for that uh, experiment. Thank you for... Um, the work that you're doing and being willing to come on here onto the show and to talk about it. Thanks for all that you do. Thank you. Thanks for having me. The team at AEA and I are dedicated to bringing this show to you because we believe that knowledge and information is the foundation of successful regenerative systems. At AEA, we believe that growing better quality food and making more money from your crops is possible. And since 2006, we've worked with leading professional growers to help them do just that. At AEA, we don't guess, we test, we analyze, and we provide recommendations based on scientific data, knowledge, and experience. We've developed products that are uniquely positioned to help growers make more money with regenerative agriculture. If you are a professional grower who believes in testing instead of guessing, someone who believes in a better, more regenerative way to grow, Visit advancingecoag.com and contact us to see if AEA is right for you.